Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Road Chose Me. My name's Dan, and today we're camping in this beautiful forest, a spot that Katie and I just found for last night. And on today's episode, I'm gonna talk to you about a bunch of little fixes, changes, and modifications that I've made to the Gladiator and to our camping and overlanding setup as we now set off to explore kind of wider in Australia. And so I feel really lucky on this trip because I'm in Australia. It means I've been able to loop back around to dad's place and you know work in his shed with all of his tools to improve a few things here and there. I didn't have that opportunity in Africa. Once I put the Jeep in a shipping container, that was it, the setup was locked in. So let's get stuck into it. I'll show you what I've been working on for the last week at dad's place. So one of the things that I really wanted to modify was the way that the fuel bottle attaches to the stove here. And this is a Coleman two burner, it burns gasoline or petrol. And the reason that I wanted to modify it, there's actually two major reasons. The first one is when you store this fuel bottle inside the stove, the little knob here that turns it on and off, sometimes it can bump into the stove and it can get turned on. And so it's happened two or three times now where you know we're on the trail for the day. And at the end of the day, when I open the stove, some petrol has leaked out, some gasoline, and it stinks and it's kind of on the rag and it's kind of all over everything. Then I end up with it on my hands. I hate the smell of petrol. I don't want to deal with it on my hands. So I really wanted a way to store this thing where it can't leak or it can't accidentally get turned on. The other reason, and a lot of people are going to criticize me for this, I just wanted it to be more convenient. And I know this is kind of hard to wrap your head around and it took me a long time to explain it to dad. When you're on the road for a week, setting up your camp is fun. You know, putting up ropes, hammering in pegs, pulling out your stove, connecting all the attachments together. And then you've got your camp and then you put your feet up and you say, wow, this is really great. And that works and I agree with that. The thing about what I'm doing though, when I'm on the road in Africa, now that I'm on the road in Australia, every single day I'm driving to a new campsite. So when I get up in the morning, I don't have like a huge, big, comfortable camp set up. What I want is the minimum camp to be able to cook breakfast, to be able to enjoy myself, put it away quickly, and then get on the road again. And that happens each and every single day for years of my life. So what I wanted with the stove was the least amount of effort to just use it. I don't wanna to have to like unfold things, connect things, move things around, because anything that you do like that, you have to undo it all again the very next morning when you wanna drive away. So what this means is now the fuel bottle is permanently attached to the stove. So this morning when I got out of bed and I was ready to start cooking, all I had to do was slide out this drawer, and this is the same if I'd just been driving. I slide out the drawer like that, I lift up the lid, and that's it, I can light the stove if I turn this on right now. It's already connected. That to me, it's a big time saver. And maybe it's only a minute in the evening and a minute in the morning. Trust me, that's gonna add up when I do it literally every single day for the next year of my life. And so how did we actually go about this? I'll show you what we did here close up with the GoPro. So the fuel bottle sits on the front of the stove like this but I needed a way to make sure that it wouldn't fall off when we're on corrugations or really rough roads. So on the inside here, what dad and I did is we installed little pins. We drilled holes in these little tabs and we've installed pins in here. And the reason for that is so that I can still take this fuel bottle off to fill it. So if I pull these pins out right now, those little split pins come out like that and now the fuel bottle is just like it is stock with the Coleman. And so I can take the fuel bottle off and I can fill it, which is a job that I need to do about once a week. But then once it's full, I'll put it back on, I'll put those pins back in, and then the bottle actually stays permanently mounted like that. So while it seems like a small thing, this is actually gonna save me many, many hours over the coming year, and I personally think, optimizing the way that the tasks you do every single day, whether it's setting up your kitchen and your cooking or setting up your sleeping, optimizing those things, is gonna make a big difference to your trip. Another big change we've made to the setup, you're gonna notice there aren't any surfboards on the roof anymore. And this was a hard decision for me to leave the surfboards at home because I really enjoyed them. We did surf a few times in Tassie, we have surfed a bunch of times in Victoria, but the simple reality is we're heading into central Australia. 
Central Australia is obviously a desert and there aren't any beaches, so there's going to be very little opportunity for surfing. The reality is in the next year, there's probably gonna be about three or four weeks on the east coast of Australia where there might be some surfing. And then there's gonna be about the same length of time on the west coast many, many, many months later. So the idea or the, the sort of option in front of us was to drag around surfboards and wetsuits for 50,000 kilometers over the next year. And we're only gonna to get to use them a handful of times. Being a minimalist, always trying to reduce weight, always trying to reduce complexity, that just didn't sit well with me. And so instead, what we'll do is we'll just rent boards. For the $50 a day it costs to rent a surfboard, I think that makes more sense than lugging around the ones that we had. And they were already getting damaged in the sun a few more months in Central Australia. And I know that they would just be damaged and beaten up and dirty. All of those things just don't give me the warm fuzzies. So in the end, I decided no surfboards. In its place, instead of surfboards, I've actually mounted a shovel on the roof rack. Rhino Rack have these great locking brackets that make it really easy to mount the shovel up there. And I think it's a good place for it. I couldn't really find anywhere in the back. Obviously, you don't want to have it in the cab, but you want it to be relatively quick and easy to get out. So for me, shovel instead of surfboards, I think there's a good chance the shovel will get a bigger workout in the deserts than the surfboards will. Because we're heading into the deserts of Central Australia, something else we need to think about is a sand flag. And so it's the idea of a sand flag is just to make your vehicle more visible when you're cresting a big sand dune. There have been some huge accidents over the years because you're going full speed up the sand dune, you don't know what's on the other side. If another vehicle is doing the same thing from the other direction, you're gonna crash at the top. So by having a sand flag, you just make the vehicle that much more visible, you know, early on because the sand flags up high. And sand flags are actually the law in Australia in certain deserts and certain national parks. You cannot go in there without one. And there's all kinds of rules and regulations. If you mount it to your front bumper, it has to be a certain height. I'm actually opting to mount mine on the roof rack, which means the flag itself only needs to be two meters high because obviously it's already that much higher off the ground. And something really cool that I didn't know, the way that lots of people attach these things, it actually just has the fitting from like an air tool on the end of it. So the same way that you would attach your air gun to your hose, that little kind of clip-in fitting, that's on the end of the flag and it's on the mount on the roof. So it's super easy just to clip this thing into the mount that's on the roof and then you're good to go, your sand flag is attached. Here we are on the roof rack again, right between the shovel and the awning, I've mounted the bracket for the sand flag. And this is a small bracket made by Rhino Rack. What I really love too about Australian companies like Rhino Rack is you know they make products that people actually need. You must have a sand flag, it's the law, therefore you need a good way to attach your sand flag. Not surprisingly, Rhino Rack are gonna offer a product to do that. So they're not going out looking for sort of a gimmicky thing or some optional extra. They're saying these are the things that you actually need. And so you can see this bracket, it has the fitting on the top that would be like on the end of your air tool. And that's what I clip the flag into. So clipping the flag in is super simple. You just push down like you do for an air tool and it clips in. And that's it, now my sand flag is attached onto my Jeep just like that. And one of the other really cool things about this bracket from Rhino Rack is that if you want to, it has the ability to fold it down. Pull this little handle out and it will lay back and then lock in the lay down option. And there's a small little wing nut too that you then thread into the side to lock it there so it won't bounce around. But obviously if you're in the desert and you need to get under some tree or some building or whatever, you can lay your sand flag down like this really easily, drive for a while, then just quickly hoist it up again. You know, that takes no time at all. Really handy little feature of the Rhino Rack sand flag bracket. And then the final thing that we've upgraded in our setup is we have a new swag. And yes, the old swag, we learned a lot. It was okay. It had some pros, it had some cons. Last night was our first night in this one, and I can tell you it's already a huge step up. And for me, when I think about buying gear, I always try not to beat myself up. And I realize that 
the first time you buy anything, you're probably not gonna do a very good job because honestly, you don't know anything about it. When I bought my first mountain bike, I didn't know anything about mountain biking. I was just getting into it. I bought one, it was kind of okay. Six months later, I sold it, but then I knew what I wanted and I bought an actual really good mountain bike that I loved. I feel like it's the same story with most of the gear that you buy. When I buy my cameras to film these YouTube episodes, when I buy accessories for overlanding for the Jeep, same story with a swag. I'd never had one before. I didn't really know what the different pros and cons are or what features I was looking for. And so with the old one, from the very first day we used it, as soon as we got in, we said, well, this is a two person swag. Why does it only have one zip? You can't even have one zip on each side. As you tried to get in, you would step in the storage pocket that was there, you know, to put your keys and your wallet in. It would hang down right where you needed to stand. So there was a bunch of features on that swag that I think nobody had ever used it who actually designed the thing. Versus this one, this is from a company called Ranger. They're here in Australia. As soon as we got in it last night, it was really obvious that the guys who design and make this thing, they really have used a swag for a lot of nights. So the first major thing is that it's freestanding. It has a support pole, so we don't even need to peg it out at all. It has kind of a vinyl floor, so the floor is going to be very waterproof. It obviously has two zips. It has storage pockets that are out of the way. It even comes with Katie's favorite feature, fairy lights, an LED lighting strip, and a little power pack so that you have lights on the inside of the swag automatically. Uh, it has like a ton of features that I think are going to be a huge upgrade over what we had. And given we're sleeping in this every single night for the next year, I think we wanna make sure it's comfortable, it's warm, it's dry, all the things you need from a sleeping space. So for now, we're really excited to have the new swag. And no doubt, I'll give you guys a review video down the road. Once we've really put it to the test and used it for a couple of hundred nights, then I'll be able to really give you the nitty gritty details of how this swag works out. So I hope that video is helpful and I hope it gets you thinking about your camping setup, your needs, and the little fixes and improvements that you might start thinking about as you get on the road. And remember too, if you're setting out to drive to Alaska, if you're driving the Pan American Highway, you're going to be in North America for quite a while at the beginning of the trip. And it's easy to get anything you need once you're on the road. So don't worry about making your vehicle perfect from day one. Just make it good enough, make it so you can actually go, you can start the trip, that is by far the most important thing. And as you go, you can start modifying or improving or changing things. It's no big deal to stop at a Home Depot, stop at a Walmart, pick up a few things here and there and buy new things or make changes before you actually cross into Mexico. And yes, changes will get more difficult once you're in Central and South America, just because there aren't shops that are gonna sell you the things you might want. Maybe you started without a fridge and then you decide you want one. You definitely wanna pick up things like that before you leave North America. But anyway, thanks very much for watching. If you did enjoy the video, hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. Here we go. Now it's time to explore far and wide into central, northern, all of Australia. This I cannot wait for. And if you're interested in getting behind the scenes content, if you'd like to get early video releases, GPS track logs, all of my campsites, including this one, all of that kind of stuff I'm making available to my supporters over on Patreon. And I'm offering one-on-one -on -one video calls with my supporters there to help talk about your trip and what you're looking to do. If you wanna get info about border crossing, safety, visas, money, vehicle setup, routes, planning, ideas, all of that, we can have a one-on-one -on -one video call and we'll chat about everything that you would like to. So if you're interested in any or all of that kind of thing, head on over to Patreon. There's a link down in the description and all the details are over there. I hope to see you over there. Thanks again for watching. Have fun out there and maybe I'll bump into you on the road. And now it's time for Aussie Food with Dan. So check it out guys, Katie and I have just driven down to Bunnings. This is like the nationwide hardware store in Australia. So it's kind of like Home Depot or one of those, you know, it's a huge big warehouse of hardware. And uh, an institution here in Australia on Saturdays and Sundays, they have a sausage sizzle. So what is that? Sausage sizzle is a barbecue. Here they are, they're cooking it over there right now. And what they're making for us 
is this, which is a sausage in bread. So Katie keeps being confused. A sausage is not a hot dog. They are not the same thing. It's kind of like a bratwurst, kind of like a smoky. It's raw meat that you have to cook on the barbecue. They cook it on the barbecue. Then they throw it in the cheapest white bread you can possibly imagine, which has the nutritional value of a piece of cardboard, I think. Underneath, I've opted to have some grilled onions. They're an optional extra. And of course, tomato sauce on top. And again, tomato sauce, not ketchup. So real tomatoes, not sugar, not vinegar. And so this thing, this sausage sizzle idea, uh, I remember doing this when I was in elementary school, growing up as a kid. This is like deeply ingrained in Australian culture that you have a sausage sizzle. And so Bunnings, you know, the national hardware store, they have capitalized on that. And obviously, you know, they encourage people to come down, you buying hardware on a Saturday or a Sunday, come down, you know, buy some sausages, buy a can of Coke, and that's your lunch for the day while you're working on whatever your project is. So sausage sizzle, nutritional value of not very much, deliciousness factor about 3050 so bon appetit this is lunch then we'll get back to work even better than i remember